Hi, I'm Ann Rieselbach, the League's Program Director, and welcome to the final set of lectures by the 2023 League Prize winners. Winners are chosen through an open portfolio competition, submitting work that responds to the competition theme, which changes annually, addressing current issues in architecture, design, and theory. Our thanks go to this year's League Prize Committee, Jose Amazarutia, Jermaine Barnes, and Jennifer Bonner for composing the 2023 theme, Uncomfortable, and for inviting additional four additional jury members, Barbara Bester, Vani Ix, Kyle Miller, and Ty Wynn. The invited jurors and committee independently evaluated over 80 entries and then worked collaboratively during an insightful jury session to select six winners from an outstanding group of finalists. We hope that you'll visit all of the winners online installations accessible on the league's website, part of what will be an extensive collection of content on archleague.org, including firm profiles, interviews, and lecture videos. All of this digital material, including an ongoing series of Instagram takeovers, was created with, the value, with valuable advice and support by league staff members, Rafi Lehman, Alicia Botero, Sarah Wessler, and Ann Carlisle. Britt Cobb and Michael Beirut of Pentagram once again designed the competition and series graphics, including a downloadable exhibition poster, which includes a QR code that brings viewers directly to the installations on the league's website. So we ask that all of you please print it out and post a copy or two to help get the word out. The entire program from the competition to the installation, lectures and related content is made possible through the enthusiastic corporate sponsorship provided by Judlow, Tischler and Son and Delta Millworks. League programs are also made possible in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Support is also provided by the Next Generation Fund, an alumni fund of the Architectural League's Emerging Voices and Architectural League Prize programs, and the J. Clauston Mills Fund of the Architectural League. And through the commitment and support of the League's members and friends, please check the League's website and sign up for our weekly newsletter to learn more about the League, including upcoming events, and especially over the summer, an extensive collection of online resources such as videos and essays documenting past programs and special projects. League Prize Committee member Jermaine Barnes will introduce the speakers. Jermaine, a 2021 League Prize winner, is based in Miami, where his research and design practice investigates the connection between architecture and identity, with a focus on how the built environment influences Black domesticity. He's an associate professor and director of the Community Housing Identity Lab at the University of Miami School of Architecture. Jermaine is a past winner of the Harvard GSD Wheelwright Prize, a Rome Prize Fellow, and most recently was awarded the Arison Award from Young Arts Miami. His work has been featured in a number of publications and installations, including the groundbreaking 2021 Wilma Reconstructions Exhibition, and is currently on display at the Venice Architecture Biennale. After the winner's presentations, Jermaine will join them in conversation and forward questions from the audience, which you should please post in the Q&A section of the site. Thank you for joining us. Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Jermaine Barnes, Studio Barnes, and tonight I have the pleasure of introducing and moderating our final lecture of the 2023 Leaf Prize Lecture Series, honoring the awardees of Uncomfortable. Along with Jose Amazarutia of TO Architecture, based in Mexico City, and Jennifer Bonner of Mall, based in Portland, Oregon, the 2023 theme, Uncomfortable, was created. During our initial call as community members, we were determined to select a term that would be inclusive of many different types of offices, from small to large, conventional to experimental. A term that would encompass contemporary issues of world architecture, as well as contextualize historical perspectives of the built environment. This was not an easy nor fast process. There were many Zoom calls and an ungodly long collaborative document where phrasing such as next time, renaissance, and neighbor were ultimately not selected. Our decision to move forward with the word uncomfortable was due to its flexibility. As we have slowly risen from the depths of a global pandemic, we have found that many young practices have been feeling awkward, nervous, and uneasy. Being forced to deal with issues ranging from dismantling problematic architectural legacies, challenging traditional paradigms, material costs, environmental catastrophes, and now today's Supreme Court ruling, we are in an age of urgency. We invited practices to demonstrate how they find comfort within the unconventional, discover opportunity within crisis, 
and use the uncomfortable as a design tool. On behalf of our committee, I would personally like to thank Ann Rieselbach, Alicia Botero, and Rafi Lehman of the Architecture League of New York, Pentagram, the designers of the beautiful poster, and our League Prize jurors, Barbara Bester, Monty Hicks, Kyle Miller, and Ty Wynn, whose time and dedication to selecting six deserving practices is most appreciated. Tonight, we welcome Katie McDonald and Kyle Schumann, co-founders of After Architecture, as well as Zach Morrison and Joseph Altshuler, principals of Could Be Architecture. I will first introduce After Architecture, followed by Could Be Architecture. And forgive me if I messed this up, because there are a lot of architectures in both of their names, so it's very easy to get confused. Katie McDonald is a licensed architect in Virginia, Massachusetts, and an assistant professor of architecture at the University of Virginia. She is a director of the Before Building Laboratory at UVA and co-curator of the Biomaterial Building Exposition. McDonald pioneers new biomaterial assemblies with the aim of creating building material systems that support the carbon and reduce construction's contribution to the environmental crisis. Current projects focus on rapidly renewable biomaterials, including wood, bamboo, grass, various invasive plant species, and hemp. Kyle Schumann is also assistant professor of architecture at University of Virginia. He is a co-director of the Four Building Laboratory at UVA and co-curator of the Biomaterial Building Exposition. Schumann seeks to advance the accessibility of digital fabrication, leveraging democratized technologies in his teaching and research, as well as inventing and building low-cost Roundup fabrication imaging systems. His work spans along processes in woodworking, metalworking, casting, ceramics, and textile production. To advance in novel digital fabrication technologies, robotics, and machine visioning systems. The jury was particularly impressed by their work in wood masonry, scarcity, and waste, and believe it is emblematic of a commitment to a sustainable ecology and material research. The duo mentioned how their work draws from pre-industrial techniques as well as develops new applications for renewable carbon sequestering materials. Which in a time where our climate crisis intensifies, material costs skyrocket, and industrialization obliterates ecosystems, political boundaries, it is most necessary. I cannot wait to hear from you both. Joseph Altshuler and Zach Morrison are both principals of Could Be Architecture, a Chicago-based practice. Joseph is an assistant professor of architecture at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He is also the director of the Architectural Companionship Laboratory, a design research lab that works at the intersection of architecture, public art, environmental graphics, adaptive reuse, and tactical urbanism. His teaching, practice, and scholarship explore architecture and public arts capacity to build lively audiences, initiate serious play, and amplify participation in civic life. Zach holds a BS in architectural studies from UIC, as well as an MR from Rice University, where he and Joseph were classmates. He is also the co-founder of the Chicago Silka Design Festival, which was launched in North Lawndale neighborhood in the fall of 2022. This public art exhibition includes multiple pavilion installations designed and built in partnership with community organizations. It celebrates the cultural heritage of the neighborhood and builds new and ongoing relationships between the Jewish community who lived there historically and the predominantly Black community that resides there today and the broader Chicago community. The jury was particularly struck by their warm and positive outlook on a more just and cohabitable architect environment. Playful shapes, colorful palettes, and joyous collaborations prove stark and refreshing. Their belief that architecture is alive, not in the metaphoric sense, but as an animated state of being that is capable of enacting agency in the world was very compelling. Could be architecture's message that more than ever before, our discomforted world needs new avenues for building companionship, friendship, and love. If we're better able to empathize with our buildings, then perhaps we might cultivate deeper empathy for our fellow humans as well. With that said, I am very thrilled to hear from these two young and incredibly talented teams to discuss their work further at the conclusion of both presentations. We will begin with after architecture, followed by could be architecture, and conclude with the Q&A discussion, which I will moderate. Please submit questions in the Zoom chat. I cannot promise that we will get to all of them, but I will do my best. Congratulations to you all. Let's get started. Good evening. It is our pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, thank you to the Architectural League and team, in particular, Rafi and, and Alicia, uh, for convening this program for young architects each year and the incredible effort it takes to see that vision through. 
Thank you to the 2023 Young Architects and Designers Committee and jury, with special thanks to Jermaine for moderating tonight's session. We admire the work each of you do and your contributions to the discipline and beyond. We also offer our congratulations to our fellow prize recipients who we are honored to be in community with. It has been a pleasure to get to know tonight's presenters, Joseph and Zach, over the last year for our respective projects for Exhibit Columbus, and we look forward to tonight's conversation. Importantly, uh, Kyle and my work together over the last 11 years would not have been possible without the sacrifices and love of our families, uh, as well as the support uh, of our academic institutions, grant organizations, nonprofit partners, and mentors. With our current work, we are proud to represent the University of Virginia School of Architecture and grateful to our leadership, colleagues, and mentors here for their support, uh, in particular, the Fab Lab team uh, who, who helps us make things. Um, we are uh, Katie McDonald and Kyle Schumann, and tonight we are excited to share with you a body of work centered on radical material applications. We are lucky to collaborate frequently with other designers, researchers, artists, engineers, fabricators, and students, and we are grateful for their contributions to this work. We'll start with a very brief uh, background of how we got here. Um, so since 2012, uh, when we were still students, um, maybe a little bit naive, uh, we've collaborated as After Architecture, a studio named to convey the built environment's impact on cultures and ecologies. We've always had an interest in making through craft, uh, digital technologies, and uh, traditional construction methods that's long uh, underpinned our work. We started our practice through designing and building permanent works of public art, often doubling as furniture and lighting. These projects then built are kind of culminated uh, in the Camp Barker Memorial in Washington, D.C., which marks the site of a Civil War era contraband camp. As our work developed, we found that our firsthand experiences with construction often stirred up questions around material impact and efficiency, explored here through the design of several household objects. One co-authored uh, with Barley, um, the, the chair you see on the left, and one providing a vehicle for cohabitation with plant life, the table on the right. Such questions Questions have shaped the design and construction of housing that leverages uh, thermal mass or existing ruins, and often and also uh, engages with cultural memory. In this case, uh, the kind of memory or impression or history uh, of camping in backwoods cabins embodied in this design build project, the cabin set in Vermont's scenic terrain. As a complement to our professional practice, we co direct an academic research lab at the University of Virginia. The before building laboratory pioneers new material assemblies to advance circular construction practices. Here our work multiplies from a team of two to a team of many. Working with paid student research assistants, we engage natural materials to develop carbon sequestering material assemblies. Such projects start as research prototypes and build into full scale construction systems that can be deployed in our practice. Our work at the Before Building Laboratory also involves the formation of scholarly communities uh, and public-facing endeavors to bring sustainable construction into popular discourse, such as the Biomaterial Building Exposition. Since its inception, UVA's Academical Village has been an architectural testing ground. The exposition expands this tradition, forging a path toward a radical material future that foregrounds environmental and human health. Architects from five universities were awarded grants to develop and exhibit full-scale installations at UVA, and a gallery show framed a larger field. So some kind of background or motivations um, for our current body of work. Um, if we think about uh, industrialization um, and the spread of the international style, we saw the deployment of concrete, steel, and glass, industrially produced materials, across ecosystems and geopolitical boundaries. In this process, building traditions that made use of locally sourced renewable materials often declined or disappeared entirely. Such materials were considered less sophisticated, predictable, and permanent, as well as more labor-intensive. 
So in essence, they're more difficult to work with. Um, they might have become less desirable through cultural changes over time, and professionals were less comfortable in guaranteeing their performance. As the climate crisis intensifies, the building sector continues to be one of the largest sources of global carbon emissions. And finite material resources are quickly being depleted on a global scale. Today, construction techniques that economically source and deploy renewable building materials must be resurfaced and advanced. Architects and builders must become comfortable working with and leveraging the unique qualities of grown and renewable matter. In three projects, we will explore how new developments allow us to reimagine traditional constraints on material economies and labor. We will show how deploying emerging technologies can facilitate collaboration with natural materials, leveraging democratized technologies, as well as inventing and building low cost ground up fabrication systems. We'll start with low, uh, materials which are local and abundant. The use of material which is local and abundant is central to the construction and composition of homegrown, a project exhibited at the Knoxville Museum of Art as the culmination of our joint Tennessee Architecture Fellowship at the University of Tennessee. The first material that this project leverages is air. Construction formwork is materially intensive and expensive, often resulting in wasted materials, including spent lumber and foam. Such waste can proliferate in the construction of customized digital forms in which each mold's geometry is specific to a surface and can therefore only be used once. Tillow forming leverages the abundant and globally available air to create an adaptable system that allows the surface geometry to be highly controlled via a digital workflow and eliminates the use of wasteful single-use molds. The machine consists of a rigid plywood surface and a grid of one foot cubic inflatable pillows made of clear vinyl, which can each be inflated individually. The flexible top surface of each pillow is attached to all neighboring pillows such that when they are inflated to different heights, they create a single and continuous surface against which material can be cast or formed. The second local and abundant material that we're working with on this project are invasive species. Homegrown expands the inventory of grown construction materials to species which are not only cu cultivated and harvested, but in fact removed as an act of remediation. The project focuses on the poster child of invasive species, the vine that ate the south, kudzu. The installation entangles discrete parts, including kudzu, bamboo, and landscaping waste into four wall panels, which form an exterior room. Read alternatively as a ruin or a topiary hedge, homegrown repositions the aesthetics of digital fabrication, replacing the smooth, crisp, machined tectonics synonymous with the digital turn with an architecture that is fuzzy, fluffy, furry, and shaggy. The next projects that we'll present uh, take on an ethos of from nose to tail. In the culinary world, eating from nose to tail means that you uh, must make use of all the edible parts of an animal, as well as the less commonly consumed kidneys, livers, etc., even using bones in the production of bone broth. In some ways, if we apply this ethos uh, into architecture, um, the timber industry has figured out how to make use of the tree from nose to tail, or maybe in this case, from twig to root. While 48% of harvested timber is unfit for construction in its whole state, it's often shredded down and composited, requiring additional energy um, and the in introduction of adhesives that often include toxic chemicals. This makes the, lump, the timber industry both highly materially efficient, um, but somewhat uh, uh, energy intensive. In the next series of projects, we explore expanding applications for wood outside of the traditional uh, timber pipeline or wood and logs that are unfit for traditional lumber production. To this end, we engage the process of twinning, which refers to the creation of digital doppelgangers or physical artifacts uh, of physical artifacts through 2D and 3D imaging technologies. This technology is not new, uh, but is becoming increasingly more accessible in low cost and low data formats. If traditional project delivery involves the creation of design documents long before material is ever acquired, twinning instead offers the potential 
to leverage 3D imaging technologies and inventory material inputs, allowing the design process to progress as a dialogue between designer and material inputs. The Tangential Timber Project uses this and other technologies to pilot an application for nonlinear or regular wood, basically wood that's, uh, that's too curved or too short to be used for traditional lumber production. Rather than cut wood lengthwise, this project develops an application for cross sections of wood called cookies in the timber industry. I wish we thought of that term, but it's, it's an existing, existing terminology. Um, wood was sourced for the project from a campus stockpile of trees felled by storm, disease, and construction. We worked closely with a UVA partner, uh, UVA sawmilling, uh, to acquire this material. Altogether, 56 linear feet of timber was cut into 164 cookies varying from three to five inches thick. A custom low-cost, low-data workflow was developed to document each of these cookies. Cookies were photographed and automatically traced in 2D and then translated into 3D digital twins through a scripted automatic process. A test assembly then takes form as a compression vault. A script sorts digital twins across the form according to their size. 5-axis water jet is then used to efficiently and precisely cut complex joinery into these irregular units of material. The, um, these cuts are tailored to the geometry of each cookie through the lofting of cookie edge profiles um, and the introduction of a dovetail connection. So the two images you see here are the front and back of the same, uh, the same joint prototype. So you see the connection detail on the left, and on the right, you see a kind of shingled appearance. Timber units double as both structure and ornament. While stru structural stress lines inscribed on the surface of the vault register as a second overlaid wood grain. These lines double as a graphic pattern for aligning wood masonry units in this uh, somewhat confusing uh, 3D puzzle during assembly. This timber masonry system is designed for disassembly. Structural blocks are joined with minimal hardware, allowing for assembly, disassembly, and reuse. The wall prototype and vault design are small-scale investigations or prototypes that suggest how customization technologies can enable designers and builders to work with, more closely with and responsibly to irregular natural materials across scales. So the next project that we'll share um, builds off of some of the kind of workflow and uh, framing of, of tangential timber. Um, this project, Sylvan Scrapple, is a project currently being developed for the fourth cycle of Exhibit Columbus, opening in Columbus, Indiana on August 25th. The cycle's theme is public by design, which seeks to create meaningful connections between people and the public spaces they share. To this end, our project draws connections between the use of waste in cooking and building. In order to create a novel mode of engagement with the biennial format that leverages each individual's personal experience, we are currently seeking recipes from Columbus locals, restaurants, other exhibit Columbus designers, and the larger public that make use of food waste to be collected and exhibited with Sylvan Scrapple. The exhibition format combines food with visual scraps from domestic dining tables, kitchen counters, restaurants, community kitchens, and local history, including Columbus's famous cereal lean factory and accompanying cookbook series. Seen here are two examples by our team members, Isaac Gooden, who made scrapple with butchering waste on the left, and Emily Foppert, who made banana bread with aging bananas, each photographed in their homes with fragments of family history and design culture. These photographs and recipes will be collected and distributed, and we invite you to submit. The, this exhibition of recipes will accompany our own version of scrap bowl. Scrap bowl or pan tenderloin is a meal that makes use of butchering waste. Pork scraps, cornmeal, wheat flour, and spices are mixed into a loaf, sliced and pan fried. Sylvan scrap bowl translates culinary resourcefulness into a material ethic for construction, combining waste streams from landscaping and demolition into an architectural assembly. The project draws from two streams. 
In Indiana, bricks are salvaged from the recently lost Irwin block located on Columbus's Fifth Street or the Avenue of the Architects. Here's an image of the Irwin block before and later after a December 2022 blaze that destroyed the building. 2,500 bricks were salvaged from the wreckage and will be reconstituted in, into brightly hued rigid Gabian uh, cages, which augment the existing walls of the Columbus Visitor Center which has a brick landscape wall along a kind of uh, wooded planter. Uh, these cages will form public furniture. Um, and then after the exhibition, be emptied of bricks and reused, two as bookshelves and two as tables. Meanwhile, in Virginia, we're uh, progressing with other components of the project. Um, in this case, nonlinear wood is composited into curving structural panel panels. Um, you can think of them as irregular uh, CLT or laminated panels. Um, this nonlinear wood is sourced from a campus uh, landscaping waste stockpile, and we're using low cost camera phone 3D scanning um, to, uh, to inventory this material um, and uh, prepare digital files for fabrication. Um, we're also uh, developing methods uh, to work with this material. Um, oftentimes there are inherent biases of the tools that we use and woodworking tools that are no exception. And so we're working to develop methods to maximize um, part geometry within this material. We've done this by securing a bandsaw end effector on a robotic arm seen here in a workshop we conducted um, in Austin, Texas. The 3D scans of the material were used to guide the saw's toolpath, making it possible to precisely mill nonlinear wood and open up applications uh, for this global uh, underused material stream. But robotic arms are often uh, quite expensive, difficult to move, limited in range, and have complex electrical and structural requirements. To democratize this workflow, we're also working on developing a low-cost mobile robotic sawmill working together with colleagues in environmental science and uh, mechanical engineering here at UVA that will allow for widespread access to a tool for working with nonlinear wood. Cutting and assembling nonlinear wood into curved forms can also increase the structural performance of the panels and produce uh, unique um, architectural and spatial conditions. We're, we're utilizing the natural curvature um, of the collected waste wood um, through this design and fabrication process. Together, the curving timber panels and brick gabion build upon the planter wall on our site in Columbus, um, linking the Columbus Visitor Center to the Cleo Rogers Memorial Library by IMP. These um, objects and constructions create thresholds, overlooks, and furniture, a wooded erase a wooded oasis for reading, dining, and play. An inventory of curved walls and brightly hued Gabian cages and Gabian furniture um, can be deployed separately after the exhibition's completion. Meanwhile, a selection of the salvaged bricks that Katie mentioned from the Irwin block in Columbus are cut and shaped into designed commemorative keepsakes that remind us and the public how much can be done with waste materials. So in, in the final section of our talk, um, we, we'd like to discuss how much of our work advancing biomaterial construction really takes form as material prototypes and pavilions. These small scale investigations and temporary installations can sometimes feel like demonstrations free from the constraints of permanent construction and habitation, kind of parlor tricks. So for the Arc League Prize, exhibition, we developed living rooms and parlor tricks, a series of models which translate our prototypes into domestic tableaus, scaling up the research into kind of permanent long-term environments. Please enjoy this teaser. A cookie from our wood masonry compression cell and nonlinear wood column are translated into a living room with a vaulted wood masonry roof. Non-linear wood walls frame a sunken courtyard and transition to vaulted wood masonry above. Twisting timber is the basis of a living room with curved laminated panels. 
which wrap both interior and exterior spaces and rest on a timber terrazzo plinth. We will end by proposing an expanded approach in which architects conceptualize and execute not just single projects, but the systems, methodologies, and technologies that enable their production. A shift in the respective agencies of architect, builder, and factory as they relate to societies and ecologies. This area is still emerging and there is much work to be done. A key focus is thus to identify the spatial potentials of these new material systems. Please join us in this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you so much to our friends at After Architecture for sharing that amazing work. Um, we've been we've been followers of your work for a long time, and it's such an honor to be uh, hanging out tonight with you. Uh, so thanks for getting the audience warmed up, and shout out to Exhibit Columbus for also bringing our practices together. Uh, thank you to the Architecture League of New York for your multiple decade long commitment to supporting, recognizing, and elevating the work of young architects and designers through this important prize. Um, and many thanks to our faculty colleagues and inquisitive students at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. We appreciate your camaraderie and we deeply value learning alongside you every day. Uh, and finally, thank you to our visionary clients, our community partners, our creative collaborators, as well as our lifelong comrades. You know who you are. All of our work is built upon convivial collaboration, and we feel so grateful and, and, and so much love for our broader architectural family and creative companions. Speaking of companions, uh, we believe architecture is alive, not alive as merely a metaphor or an analogy, but as an animated state of being that is capable of enacting agency in the world, decentering and anthropo post-centric worldview sometimes makes folks uncomfortable. And our work invites communities to find comfort and even delight in the discomfort and humility integral in a, to a world in which humans do not proclaim a privileged dominance. Architecture can do so much more than provide for our creature comforts. What if architecture actually was a creature, another animate being with whom we might initiate companionship and other kinds of interpersonal relationships? More than ever before, our discomforted world needs new avenues for building companionship, friendship, and love. We found that love is a word that's often conspicuously absent from the discourse on architecture, and we founded our practice to remedy that. If we're, if we're able to empathize with our buildings, then perhaps we might cultivate deeper empathy for our fellow humans as well. We believe each project is a possibility to test new means for amplifying access to architecture's inherent liveliness, rendering relationships between humans and our built environment more loving. So tonight, we'd like to propose three architectural acts for breathing new life and new love into your architecture, and for letting architecture breathe new life into you. Tonight, we'd like to invite you to hug your architecture, to saturate your architecture, and to activate your architecture. And rather, present, rather than present our work in a conventional project portfolio format, tonight we'll offer you all an impressionistic tasting menu of some favorite moments from our projects spanning the last six years that collectively demonstrate each of these three thematic lenses for looking at architecture and the world. I think I... Apologies. Pictured here is an installation at the Siebel Center for Design at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. We call it the Animate Arcade. The Animate Arcade inserts a family of independent but interrelated architectural creatures into the existing building's public spaces to offer new programmatic possibilities and interior landmarks. 
For our digital installation as part of the 2023 League Prize, we asked three artists to use the format of moving image to conjure the animate, lively, and discomforting qualities of the built installation. So we'll introduce each of our three acts of animate architecture tonight with a short one to two minute film that reinterprets that installation. Welcome to act one, intimate interfaces. Intimate interfaces offer spaces with a friendly scale and shapely identity that generates a spatial salutation. In a space that's too big to be a display case and a little too small to be a gallery, you might find yourself inhabiting an in-between realm, a space articulated by forms that are just specific enough to be creaturely friends, but just abstract enough to invite your own body to insert itself in and complete them. In the process, you might snuggle up and punch a small cartoon-shaped hole into the fabric of reality in order to suggest an alternative world of inhabitation being possible. When a mid-century house designed by a mid-century dude is in an awkward state between a museum house and a museum gallery, you could reintroduce the original walls as flowing fabric partitions, a nod to Lily Reich, retracing moments of domesticity otherwise lost to history. But by poking holes through those walls with a puppet theater or a bed or a couch so that someone in the study could eavesdrop on the conversation in the living room, or sleep with their head in the maintenance closet, you can call back into question architecture's role in shaping that domestic choreography. With a room that serves as a second bedroom, an office, a library, and an at-home gym, the bookshelf becomes the wall and the desk waves hello when it's time to work and waves goodbye when it's time to stretch. And when your living room is shaped like a slice of pie with the ceilings that are a little too tall, you introduce tiered seating and paint the sky, a bold graphic that blurs the edge between ceiling and wall, the vibrant saturation of color produces an interior atmosphere of its own. And as you host a dinner party for eight, you might peek into the living room as you carry on a conversation from the kitchen, both with your guests and with your house. You talk with your house often, arranging art, finding the perfect spot for afternoon light with your afternoon book and inviting a rotating cast of spices to accompany the farm fresh veggies. And afterwards you might step outside and as the, the neighborhood around you embraces the possibility of growing its own food and cultivating a community around the earth, you might offer seeds from your belly as you perch within the reintroduced prairie along the parkway. And during that performance, as you explore the dynamics between life and art, history and future, you might find yourself on a shapely stage that is as multifaceted as you are. As it rotates, it's, it reveals many personas and projections of places that spill into your music, an altar, a stoop, a window and a throne. We've made it to act two, gregarious graphics which create a constellation of vibrant color fields and bold patterns that gather social groups around specific aesthetic atmospheres. From the ground to the walls to overhead canopies, gregarious graphics disrupt static planes of space and recolor our everyday relationships.
In Gary, Indiana, a vibrant landscape of murals wander their way across the city, elevating places and people through art and the public realm. Can the more mundane moments of a crosswalk and a sidewalk also come alive? Bold shaped creatures slip onto the road, their forms evoking movement in a subtle way to point you across the street or to a nearby bus stop. Part public infrastructure and part new friends, the graphic creatures pride you forward. And in a shuttered Chicago public school in classroom 303, in the heat of the Midwest summer, you find a game board laid out before you. Part tangram, part garden party chess, part carpet showroom. You note that the colorful color coding on the faces and a regular geometry, perfect for snapping into alignments. These carpet creatures can shuffle, they can flip, they can cuddle, they can tip. And as they come together, they form walls and seating lounges. They complete the grid and break it up. They write new language and they form caves for classroom spelunking. You might not know them when you walk into the classroom, but the time by the time you've left, each have a nickname. Bird, pointed cube, shifted house, the periscope. You found joy in the play of graphics rendered in three dimensions. Walking into the universalizing space of a large atrium, you may find yourself disoriented and in need of guidance. In turn, you may discover lively landmarks looking back at you with open arms and open eyes. Juicy colors pop out of the neutral surroundings, saturating your moment of arrival with a warm glow. And further into the space, an archway articulates an aperture that frames multiple possible performances, a lecture, a fashion show, an informal chat. A few strategic holes punctuated here and there Permit the architecture to direct its gaze while you peek into the programming just beyond. You notice that these creatures seem to embody facial expressions, postures, charisma, an attitude that collectively initiate companionship with you, their human visitor, as you continue to explore. You're a pomegranate shaped and colored pavilion that welcomes friends to pop their head under your outstretched arms inviting playful engagement and immersion inside your light-infused perforated enclosure. With a bold shape that offers a graphic contraposto poised at any moment to leap into motion, you could start walking around with your new friends half inside and half out. This vibrant canopy creates an acoustic friendly space for you to listen to performances or open mic nights. Its animate form suggests an ambiguous cosmic creature launching into the atmosphere. And after a few tasty libations, you may find yourself wandering around and around, looking at your feet and following a graphic path that leads you back to the bar to close your tab. We've reached act three. Haptic happenings position spatial and programmatic invitations that grant agency for multiple publics to touch and interact with their immediate environment. By acting and activating the full range of human sensation, emotions, and actions, haptic happenings welcomes new audiences and lively actions.
with a curated reading list and a provo provocation to take a look in a book, you're invited to snuggle into an intimate nook that transports you into the storied worlds of fantasy and new knowledge. The duplicated array of nooks transforms the often solitary nature of reading into a communal act. With a zigzagging configuration along a highly trafficked school corridor, the array of nooks offer different messages depending on the direction from which you approach. Leaning this way and leaning that way, you find a cozy spot to read with friends. Ordinary stairs are expected to stand still. Your colorful knot stairs are liberated to tumble, twirl, rock, interlock, cuddle, ride piggyback, and climb atop one another. Through a live performance of physical models, you might propel a familiar architectural part into lively locomotion. And at the same time, you might consider new ways that everyday architectural parts could also launch into animated movement. And during a time when gatherings needed to be outdoors and when communities were looking for new ways to access art, you might encounter a family of versatile exhibition displays that pop up in public parking lots for social distance cultural programming. Your system acts as an interchangeable kit of parts, combining conventional gallery walls with billboard displays and artifact tables and selfie stations and cabinets of curiosity and art making booths, pops of color and characterful positions amplify the identity of each modular configuration. These moments of specificity allow the system to retain its recognizability, even as you encounter a wide variety of happenings occurring in, on, and around these creaturely architectures. Blending art, programming, and social infrastructure, you find yourself immersed in a new ecology of culture making and community. Looking for a communal activity, you might find a friend in and with your architecture. Your everyday playground seesaw combines form and program into a single object of joy and interaction, enhanced by cooperation that also negotiates gravity. Meet High Five Hilda. What if you could give a high five to a seesaw? What if a seesaw could pump its fist back at you? Meanwhile, Rebound Rodney is the perfect seesaw companion for multitaskers. You can practice your, your hoop game while teeter-tottering with your buddy. Thermal Thelma is part seesaw, part hot tub, or as you like to say, a sea spa. Swimsuits are optional while you inhabit Thelma's sizzling waters. The Chicago Suka Design Festival is a public art and architecture celebration of outdoor pavilions that invites you to explore cultural heritage and build solidarity among multiple communities. The festival amplifies cross-cultural collaboration and social justice by initiating meaningful design collaborations among diverse designers and social service organizations in Chicago's North Lawndale neighborhood. During the week-long festival, the landscape of unique circuit structures is activated with cross-cultural public programming, bringing together the intersectional pairings of neighborhood groups. After each annual festival, the pavilions are then relocated and permanently reinstalled at the facilities of the community organizations that co-design them, where they take on new programming and new activities. Architecture is not just alive once, it is also embodies the capacity to take on a vibrant second life in a new location and context. Sometimes there are communities traversing the city in very close proximity, but that rarely cross paths with one another. One group might be exploring the architecture of a neighborhood while another is out for a midweek jog. What if the creative routing of circulation paths through our cities invited existing communities, audiences, and spectators to intersect in new and unexpected ways. You might just find yourself participating in a 5K race that doubles as an architectural tour of neighborhood landmarks. Athletes and biennial tourists collide while aspirations to explore culture and sustained fitness merge. It might just be enough to turn the architectural tourist into a runner and the avid runner into an architectural enthusiast. 
Or at the very least, you might initiate some new conversations with your neighbors while you figure out what's going on in the streets. And in that act of reframing architecture's agency and building intersectional audiences, we're pleased to say that you have reached the finish line. Thank you so much for listening to us tonight. Um, such a pleasure to, to share some work and we're excited to, uh, we're excited to chat with, uh, with After Architecture and with Jermaine. Thank you so much. It was a great presentation. Uh, thank you to all of you, Joseph, Zach, Katie, Kyle. Um, we are now at the Q&A portion. Um, we'll start with me asking you all a few things that way the audience can get warmed up. Um, please submit all questions in the Q&A. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we'll do our best um, to get to them. And if you have one that's directed to a specific audience, please let us know. Um, otherwise, I will ask them in the general sense that they appear in the chat. So that said, um, we'll go ahead and get, get started so that we don't put too much pressure on the audience to give us the first questions. Uh, there were a lot of overlaps that I saw within both of your work. Um, so I just want to let you all know ahead of time, there may be some uncomfortable questions that you're going to have to answer, right, um, beyond the fact that that is the brief. And so we're going to start with probably perhaps the most uncomfortable of questions. Uh, how do each of your practices approach individuals who may say that these are non-traditional type projects that you are presenting and the sort of absence of physical buildings or larger structures? Uh, well, I guess I unmuted, so I'll have to answer first. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know that we've found as many people uncomfortable with them once they exist in the world. I think there's often a have healthy sort of skepticism about the sort of drawn version of things before they exist. But I, I mean, particularly for us, I think once we've sort of enacted them, uh there, there's i mean people tend to adopt them in their own in their own ways and and become uh companionable with them which is which is maybe a way to sort of skirt your question a little bit but uh yeah i i might agree i think um the previous generations have done a lot of work for us in expanding the definition of architecture. So I'm, I'm grateful to them for that. Um, but I think we're, we're always interested in how do you kind of play with a new idea and you're probably not gonna do it on a 40,000 square foot project first. You probably need to you know kind of test it out a bit. Um, so we really enjoy that process. It does make uh, building even small things a lot more complicated than than it would if we did traditional construction, but for some reason we keep doing it. <laughs> and I think Zach's uh, like experience of like the seeing is believing idea um, is something that we definitely experience as well, right? Like trying to have deliver every like idea or investigation as like a physical prototype, even if it's not experienced by people physically, just having like photographs of it as opposed to renderings or drawings uh, does a lot in terms of like believability and like convincing people that these things are possible even at uh, even at small scales like first. Yeah, I think that, that's like part of the idea behind doing something like the biomaterial exposition was uh, that there are like people doing really interesting things with logs, with mushrooms, uh, with nurse logs, um, but how do you get that in front of the public? Uh, if it's a physical kind of artifact, they might be more likely to buy into it. So, yeah, we love the the small scale for for the kind of demonstration capacity. And I think I would just briefly add, I think both of our practices, um, both of our practices actually named ourselves in a way that starts to question or challenge, let's say, um, architecture or design as we know it. And in that way, like uh, maybe it's like a, a it's like a cheat code for us to sort of insert uh, or, or to even preempt a conversation about like is that architecture? 
um, by building it into actually the name of our practice. I might be being presumptuous on behalf of why Kyle and Katie named their practice that way, but that's certainly one of the multiple reasons that Zach and I did. Yeah, I think you're spot on. Well, I think I think this is a, a a great sort of segue into how the perception of architecture um, may differ from the realization of architecture and. I find the audiences that each of you collaborate with, and I want to emphasize the word collaborate, um, very compelling. So uh, my next question to each of you is, between the material research that you're doing at UVA, and then sort of the graphic aesthetic that you all are using in the Midwest, Chicago specifically, Joseph and Zach, how might those collaborations and the people that you're working with enhance the work that you're doing and then offer new possibilities that again relate to the way that you identify yourselves as practitioners. It's a great uh great topic, Jermaine. I think um we've found uh as our work's progressed over time that it's kind of demanded more and more collaboration with fields beyond architecture and design. So a lot of the material research projects that we're developing here at UVA um, involve material scientists, engineers, environmental scientists. And I always find it's interesting how architecture can become a kind of vehicle for bringing these different voices together and kind of choreographing a discussion um, among those disciplines, but also among the public, which I think is something like Zach and Joseph, your work does like exceedingly well. Yeah, I think we see the material itself as a collaborator too. So like there's some pushback on, you know, what we think versus then like how things actually work. And so we have to respond. But um, yeah, I also like love the way that Joseph and Zach, you use architecture to collaborate with all these different stakeholders, right? Whether it's like a run or a cultural festival or, you know, an elementary school it gives you like a way to interface with a group you might not be able to uh, in, you know, in your daily life. Yeah, and I think while our work is maybe less material research driven than after architecture's work is, I think we also, if not the material per se, we definitely think about, uh, in, we, we think about bodies of architecture as collaborators and that we are in conversation with. But I also think like when it comes to like specifically like Jermaine, you brought up the question of, of graphics, for instance, which is something that's very near and dear to our heart. Um, and, and really, I think for us thinking about um, sometimes I, I say like, oh, we're, we're architects who sort of like wish we were graphic designers because we're really interested in how uh, graphic techniques can play out spatially and dimensionally in the world. Uh, and, and so in a very direct way, that uh, absolutely uh, compels us to collaborate with, with people who are actually trained in that expertise and to find also like fellow travelers. I mean, this is like maybe a good chance to give a shout out to our collaborator and colleague, Nikita Thomas, who's a colleague of mine here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and, and a collaborator of ours, who is a, a, a graph, is trained as a graphic designer, but also maybe comes from the reverse standpoint of, of wishing that, that she, uh, or not wishing, but, but believing in the power of graphic design to have uh, effects in the three-dimensional experiential realm. Like we find these kind of fellow travelers that are, are kind of interested in, in challenging those, those questions of disciplinary agency. So I wanna, I wanna ask a couple of pointed directed questions at, at each of your, your practices before we jump back into sort of the dual questions. And again, uh, to our visitors, uh, if you'd like to ask something, please drop it in the Q&A. So this question is to Joseph and Zach. Um, you made the comment that you sort of started your practice based on a dedication to love and architecture and what it means to both love the building, but love the people who are a part of the building process and the rituals to go along with that. Um, how do you find this approach uh, to be generative of the type of things that you're doing, be that small scale chairs, playscapes, uh, 
bars inside of a inside of a brewery, etc. Um, how does that four letter word begin to push you forward into the work that you all are doing on a regular basis? I mean, I think I think it has a lot to do with uh, projecting a future that is more empathetic, and and that that has a uh, has a sort of like goal of joy. Like, I, I mean, I think those things sort of like blend together in, in in love, right? Like that that it that it is sort of striking a moment of optimism, um, in in times that can be you know as as we see going on currently joseph lost power like you know the the world has some dark spots so um trying to use that as a way to sort of blend people together but also to blend um the built environment with the people yeah and i think i would just briefly add to that i think for us it's kind of this triangulation between love and joy and empathy and those things are very overlapping and kind of mutually inform each other. So a practice that's rooted in love is really about thinking about how every design move we can make helps form connections between people, uh, both between human people, between between people and pe between humans and humans, between humans and architecture, and also between architecture and architecture. Um, there's empathy available, I think, in all three of those kind of possibilities of loving relationships. Um, and, and so every design movie is about trying to find a way to build a relationship or to build a connection among beings, both biotic and abiotic. And so I want to I want to stay there for a second when we jump to uh, after architecture, because I think this idea of joy and care is something that I also find in your work, specifically the project that you're doing with the uh, the recipes and, and, and how you're finding ways to include the general public and be able to tell their stories um, as well. So can you talk for a bit about how the sort of a background and the inspiration for their project came from the material research at Scraps and as a way of still allowing those people to understand that you're not treating their personal histories as Scraps, but that their personal histories have longevity because I can understand that maybe the, the, the label could make people feel a certain way considering how much they may care about those recipes? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I, I love the question. I think uh, there's, you know, there, there are some like fundamental things that everyone experiences, uh, like everyone eats every day, right? So everyone has to find a way to feed themselves. Uh, you know, some people may get further into cooking than others, but oftentimes, even if someone's not the one cooking, uh, someone who loves them is cooking, right? Or they have memories of someone who loved them cooking. Um, and so I think there's this kind of cultural memory, but also daily ritual in food um, that I think also relates a lot to architecture. So uh, even if we don't call it architecture, everyone grows up in buildings, right? Uh, you know, that whether it's their home, or school, or, you know, they see and interact with buildings, different forms of shelter all the time. Um, and so, yeah, if, if people feel empowered to share recipes, to like pass recipes down through families, to share them with friends, um, maybe that kind of ethos can, can also be translated to how we think about architecture. Uh, and it kind of plays into maybe some of uh, what, what Zach and Joseph are doing, which is like, how do you get people to love architecture? I mean, they do love it. They love their home, right? Whatever the size, like usually people thought like warm connections to places. So um, yeah, we wanted to tap into that kind of similar ethos and that similar ritual that you're you're in these things every day. Um, but we also were thinking about, you know, how the place setting becomes like a design artifact, right? When you prepare a meal, whether it's for like, a cultural rit ritual, a religious holiday, or it's your, you know, morning breakfast, you're setting the table somehow, right? And so there's this like active design and how you keep your home and prepare your home, just as there's a kind of active design in cooking. So we thought we could kind of bring those together. Um, yeah, so, so send us your recipes. <laughs> we also uh, just like food as a way to like convey architectural ideas. So like tying back to like your first question, Jermaine, about like 
perception and sort of seeing things as like not architecture, is it architecture? So the analogy of like scrapple in our case, like applying a like culinary ethos to material at a building scale um, was one of the ways that we tried to like frame a, an argument around material and architecture in a way that would be maybe more accessible um, to people who aren't trained in, in design school, right? Like in America, there's very, a very small percentage of the population like actually is trained in architecture. And so, you know, basically like the audience here. Um, and so we're like always looking for ways to kind of increase accessibility, like bring those narratives uh, to a broader public. I mean, I think it's a super, I mean, just to jump in on that, like it's a super, uh, amazing way to kind of like expand the audience uh, really explicitly, right? Like, uh, okay, like everybody knows what banana bread is, like, or if you don't know what banana bread is, you know what Scrapple is, right? Not everybody knows that you can like 3D scan a log uh, and then laser jet that. Like, I, I mean, right? Like that, 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 but in setting up the sort of analogy, it actually opens up the conversation about the like crazy technical things that you guys are doing with materials in, in a way that is a narrative. Could I ask a slight a, a question that may seem superficial, but I mean it really sincerely. And this may be in part, this is a question to Katie and to Kyle. Um, I mean, I admit that part of this question is just you saying cookies like 20 times in your presentation made me hungry. But in all seriousness, is there not another logical step in your project where you do start to fabricate edible architecture? Or maybe this is a pitch for it could be after architectural collaboration. Uh, I'm on board for that collaboration. I, I'm on board for any collaboration. That sounds super fun. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I I keep saying we need to do like a school wide competition where we use the fab lab to like bake to fabricate cakes or desserts or something, just as like a way to get some people who are afraid of the tools to use them for something low stakes you know mm -hmm. um so yeah i love i love that idea as well like robotic arm to to mix the bread that needs the most kneading ever exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but, it, but nice. it may sound gimmicky though but in all seriousness if if your, your project is equally about the methodologies and delivery for things that have uh, dimensions, material qualities, and geometric qualities that can't be necessarily predicted or that have natural variation, like the variations in logs. And it seems like not a heavy stretch to think about what that means for, I mean, I'm sitting in, surrounded by cornfields, like what that means surrounded by various sorts of uh, edible matter. Yeah, I mean, every time you, you know, bake a loaf of bread, you're collaborating with like thousands of uh, you know microorganisms and the yeast like making it rise it's like a biofabrication process and it has certain behaviors that you can predict and some you can't predict you can't control so if we if, if we stay here with this potential collaboration of uh, could be after architecture design what what type of things are each of you learning from your research labs because there's a lot of overlaps that like both of you have labs both of you are in the in the uh, exhibit Columbus cycle this year. So if we just stay with the lab, how is the lab informing your practices, but then also allowing you to begin to shape the uncomfortability of the traditional architect into our version, your version of just a more spatial practice? Well, maybe I'll start it off with a brief statement, then then someone can take it further. But I think the the vehicle of the lab for us is a lot like the vehicle of teaching. Um, there's a lot of joy in teaching and being able to share your expertise with with others. Um, but there's also a lot of joy in being able to learn from your students, right? So you're always getting like this new information, you're always having your worldviews, you know, challenged. Um, and I think the lab also provides an opportunity for that. You get to work with students, right? So they're still actively pursuing their education, sometimes coming with other disciplines as well. And they're always kind of, uh, you know, asking different questions than you might get uh, in a typical practice scenario. Um, so I really like the kind of collaborative back and forth there. 
and then the kind of you know the scientific uh, aspect of research that allows you to propose something and perhaps fail at it. Uh, so that's a big, you know, a big bonus in terms of taking risks. Yeah, it's definitely a, a way to take more substantial risks than we could if we were, you know, working solely for clients uh, doing buildings. And there's still a long way to go in, you know, convincing people or show, proving that some of these materials and strategies could be applied at scale in architecture. Uh, but it's a start. And I think that the academy has a large role in, in taking those risks um, as a kind of first step in that process. Yeah. Yes, and to everything after architecture says. Um, next time we make a firm, we're going to call it yes and architecture. <laughs> I would add to that. So the lab, our lab, the architectural companionship laboratory, is absolutely a way to bring students into a broader conversation about these questions. It's also for us sort of a moniker and uh, a name that we use to uh, put experiments in writing, a sort of uh, under. And this is, we need to give a shout out to our, our dear colleague, collaborator, and comrade, Julia Sedlock, who is sort of our partner in writing and part of the Architectural Companionship Laboratory. Uh, we wrote a book together called Creatures Are Stirring, A Guide to Architectural Companionship, um, which teases out through both fiction and nonfiction uh, different kinds of scenarios that may not yet exist or that we may not yet have the opportunity to build with our clients or to practice in the world, but to use writing as another space of speculation and world building. Uh, and so for us, the lab is a way to, uh, just a, a way of organizing experiments in writing as just as much a part of the design and world building process as much as experiments in practice, which is the could be side of things. So we do have a question from the audience. Um, and it says, hello, I admire the material and relational innovation in both of your bodies of work. Tying back to the first question about non-traditional architecture, do either of the practices envision potentials to apply their innovative approaches to larger structural or programmatic works in the future of construction? Or how may your demonstrations open minds to such applications? Yeah, I mean, I think that question is uh, a good one and something that we're always thinking about. And so, I mean, in terms of opening minds to to these applications, I think we all touched on that, talking about like prototypes and believability of like physical artifacts. Um, but we're also always working on looking at how to scale and implement these technologies, you know, in, in buildings. And one of the things that we're doing with like 3D scanning and um, this is something Mario Carpo writes about a lot is like the knowability of like structural performance, for example, and the fact that uh, we're able to now simulate more and more complex assemblies with maybe less homogeneous materials, more eccentricity, more you know, geometry, more irregularity in materials um, and forms that we're that we're building with. And so um, we're always like looking at ways that the, the materials and technologies that we're developing. Um, could be uh, like quantified in a way that they could like approach something that could move into the building code, you know, maybe one day. There's a lot of testing and sort of work that has to be done in a kind of codification process like that. Um, but it's something that we hope that our work can, can lead to in the future. Yeah, I think like one other aspect of that that I would mention is just the idea of trying to use more democratized tech. Um, or you know tech with lower barriers to entry so you know we showed a picture from Frank Gehry's office in the 90s of 3D scanning so it's been around but now it's actually easy for us to use we don't have to have any fancy equipment we just need a smartphone app uh, and you know it, if the the data size has come down much more we have ways to like lower the data of the files too but um, just being able to like use tech that's avail readily available um, hopefully brings the barriers to entry down if you want to scale or apply a kind of idea on a larger project. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, and that accessibility also opens these like tools and these conversations to non-disciplinary voices. I think like that's part of the place we see ourselves is uh, we're not like, research scientists, uh, we don't hold, you know, doctorates in engineering, 
Um, and we're not traditional practitioners, but we might operate in the space between where we can see how some of the tools might actually be able to translate into practice and real projects. And I think that's important uh, that that research, you know, finds ways to to impact actual, you know, practice and our discipline at large. And I think from our end, uh, I think the answer to the question is yes, we absolutely are interested in thinking about larger uh, structural programmatic works, larger scale deployment of our ideas. Um, I think for us, it's slightly less about technology and it's slightly more about thinking about workflows of professional practice um, as a small firm and as small practitioners. I think that like for Zach and I, we, uh, we're a small firm, there's two of us. And we don't have, while we absolutely have ambitions of uh, scaling up work and the types of projects that we're working on uh, and the impact we can have in the world, we less have an aspiration to like grow our practice into a giant firm. We're not super interested in management. Um, we're, that's just less of our professional interest. So what we're interested in is thinking about other modes of professional practice workflow that can allow a small practice like us to work on big projects. And I think one thing we really see about that is teaming up with other small firms. This is another pitch for the could be after architecture collaboration um, to build solidarity and networks of different small firms that can together tackle the scale and specificity of a big project that we would otherwise not have the capacity to do with just the two of us without building a kind of large staff of employees to manage, which we're less interested in. I also think there's an increasingly interesting sort of overlap happening between, let's say, the more um, uh, traditional uh, works, right? Like, you know, interior renovations, commercial work, and the sort of like public programming, public art side of the practice, right? That that those two things begin to talk to each other as a sort of overall practice um, in, in a way that like, you know, uh, graphic moments uh, begin to sort of show up in bathroom walls as a way to like create a space in a space, right? That 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 then gets applied to a sort of landscape uh, that happens in a sort of field and and activates some big festival gathering, right? That those things begin to play out in in different scales and different intensities uh, as the projects need. And I would just to capitulate that thought, like as a small firm, like our more civic projects that we've had the sort of privilege to engage so far have been, let's say to use a normative category, sort of been like in the realm of public art. And I think that has only kind of fueled our interest in how public art can have a kind of urban design agency or how public art can operate uh, in a broader kind of civic realm, not just as a kind of decoration of the city, but actually as something that transforms how the city is organized, how relationships in the city are built, um, and and like what the future of civic life could be. So I think we're increasingly interested in, in trying to position our practice in a way that can allow public art to have a kind of amplified agency in how the city is organized. I love that. Yeah. Go for it. No, sorry. No, no, go for it. Go for it, Katie. Well, I think, you know, uh, Kyle and I have, have done some work in the public art realm and, like, always been excited by the agency you're given as an artist versus, versus an architect, um, actually. And so you can actually, like, start, start to do things that might sometimes be uh, difficult in other contexts. And I know, Jermaine, you also operated in this space and leveraged this space quite a bit. So I think yeah, it's a really interesting space for small firms and young practices. And also, I mean, just the fact that you're like putting work out in the public, right? It's like a little bit different than like doing it, starting a, a small practice doing kitchen renovations or something. It was amazing as well, but the work is like tested in a different way when the public is like literally walking through or sitting on or touching it, right? That's like weather uses that you could have never anticipated or didn't anticipate that. Or intend when you're first designing it. So there's like a testing idea that comes along with public art that I also find really exciting and challenging, but very exciting. Well, I mean, part, part of the reason why I requested to moderate this specific 
panel of both of your offices is because of the similarities that I see within my own practice of varying scales of work and the desire to do larger scale or stay at a personal one-to-one -one scale. And I think um, I'm really drawn to this idea of the second life and that is the second life that both of your practices are, are committed to. Katie and Kyle, yours in material, uh, Joseph and Zach, yours as in materials, then going on and having a second use in another location, because oftentimes a lot of this work is temporary. Um, it contributes to our climate, our climate crisis uh, that we're seeing on a regular basis. Um, so it would be awesome if you both can give us a quick answer on your interpretation of the second life. And, and how you see it as a possibility going forward for many other practices, not just your own. Yeah, I think, oh no, go ahead, Zach, please. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it, you know, as, as is typical and you pointed out, like a number of the sort of initial projects like had a sort of lifespan that then like got trashed, which, you know, is sort of like heartbreaking. So the, the, now we're sort of always making kind of active efforts to make sure that like what whatever sort of resources between material and, and monetary resources that are put into something that exists in the public and has a sort of defined lifespan like has has some place to go afterwards and i think that that was a big sort of motivation between the the circuit festival in that like we could sort of use this infrastructure to produce uh pavilions that then had an active second life built into them where a community organization that has a space like can can use that thing and it and it operates in a in a, a different way and i think sort of i'll let joseph jump in but i mean i think that actually ties back into the to the love idea right like that by by getting someone to like love these things that are put in the world like then the sort of stewardship for like long term care of it and use of it is like is on them right after the sort of designer steps away like but like if you love your house like you're going to repaint it you're going to fix the siding right like that that sort of it is a is a maybe a you know is a form of sustainability above like slapping a green roof on it right and that requires it requires foresight and requires anticipation it, it requires the love to think about the second life before you get there so it doesn't become an afterthought and that whether it's through relocation, reconfiguration, reprogramming, reappropriation, or other means of material, programmatic, and cultural transfer, that that's like part of the identity of how it's designed. Yeah, I, and I would say also for us, the idea of second life is extends both before and after like the architectural life of a project. And so uh, more and more, even for like temporary projects, we feel that there's a kind of need to consider what happens to those materials after their useful life as architecture, right? Like maybe they can be installed on other sites, they can become furniture, and they can go through kind of different phases. But then we also need to consider like what happens to those materials when they end up in the landfill or they end up, you know, in the environment, are they compostable? Like what happens? Are they able to be disassembled? Um, there's also an idea, I think, of like a a second yield on the material sourcing side. And so if you think about like, I don't know, uh, a pecan farm like is generating like nuts to sell for food, right? It's also generating all these other materials, the shells and the husks, and what could you do with those materials, right? And so we try to apply that ethos to like timber with some recent projects and looking at like, what are the other parts of a, a tree, right? When a tree is cut for timber, there's a lot of branches, there's leaf material, right? Like what happens to those materials, even if it's sort of taking them, diverting them from their kind of like natural life cycle in the environment and composting and extending their life through like use in architecture that then could be like, you know, returned to that natural cycle in the environment uh, afterward. So I think there's a lot of ways to think about a, a second life. Maybe it's like a before life and an afterlife also. You're just, get, you're just getting into our firm name, Pat. Staying on brand. This has been uh, an absolutely wonderful evening amongst a very crappy day of which uh, equity is constantly under fire. Um, you all as educators um, have allowed us the possibility of joy and love within your work. And, and I hope that those who stayed with us the entire time um, see that joy in the work 
and you as faculty take on the consistent battle of making sure that our classrooms remain as diverse and inclusive um, as the world actually is today. I'd like to add my thanks to all of you for this incredibly, your great presentations and incredibly thoughtful discussion. And um, I, you know, I kept thinking about with all three firms, actually, the generative possibility of the line and the kind of embracing form of all of your designs and the kind of embedded memories, um, sensory memories in some cases, as well as physical memories that all of the projects, you know, entail and how they embrace sort of individual and form and small groups, I will be super intrigued to see how things scale up in the future and the collaboration that I think would work well between all three of you, actually. So thank you very much. This actually marks the end of our program year. We always end the year by looking forward with the youngest firms. And I think this is just um, presented all sorts of possibilities for us to do so. As a reminder to everybody, videos of all of these lectures will be available in the coming weeks, along with interviews with um, the winning firms. So please keep coming. And you can watch older presentations like Jermaine's. Um, and they're all archived on the league's website to tide you through the summer till we have more live programming in the fall. So thanks, everybody. <laughs>